In the United States alone, hundreds of thousands of people are reported missing each year. Many return home safely, but there are others who seem to vanish into thin air under extremely mysterious and disturbing circumstances. And whether or not they'll return home or how it happened at all may remain unknown forever. <laughs> In January 2nd, 2000, 18-year-old Zeb Quinn was looking forward to the end of his shift at a Walmart in Asheville, North Carolina. He planned to look at a car he wanted to buy with his friend, Robert Owens, but the night didn't go as planned. On the way to look at the car, Zeb received a page from his aunt. Needing to return the call immediately, he found a payphone, but after hanging up, he became agitated, rear-ending Robert's truck in his frustration. Zeb called off their plans for the night and drove away. Two days later, someone called in sick to Zeb's shift at work, but it wasn't Zeb. Robert confessed to making the call, claiming Zeb had asked him to do so. But Robert's statements to police weren't adding up. The day of Zeb's disappearance, Robert sustained injuries from a supposed car crash, a car crash that never happened. The case takes a strange turn when Zeb's car is found. The back windshield sported a lipstick drawing of a pair of lips, and inside the car was a jacket, a hotel key, and a live puppy, none of which were Zeb's. Detectives learned Zeb was involved with a girl named Misty Taylor, and that he'd been the target of threats by her abusive boyfriend. Then, police add another bizarre piece to the puzzle. The page from Zeb's aunt came from her home phone, but at the time it was sent, she was out with Misty, Misty's boyfriend and Misty's mother. She never sent the page and came home to find her house had been broken into. While there have been no direct developments in Zeb's case since, in June 2015, Robert Owens was arrested in connection to a murdered couple. Some believe Robert killed Zeb and buried his body on his property, but no supporting evidence has been released. Though police believe that Zeb was murdered the night he went missing, neither his remains, whereabouts, or the circumstances of his disappearance have been uncovered, and answers are scarce. The morning of November 21st, 1987, 26-year-old Karina Malinowski didn't show up for work. Her car was found parked in front of Mount Holly Plantation in South Carolina, where her husband, Stephen, worked as a caretaker. But Karina was gone. Stephen said Karina went for a drive at 11 p.m. the night before and never returned, and no one had any idea where the missing mother was. Almost a year later, on October 4, 1988, Karina's 11-year-old daughter, Annette, walked to the school bus stop with her dog around 7 a.m. The bus stop sat in front of the Mount Holly Plantation, where her mother disappeared. Annette never made it to school and was never seen again. The only trace of her was a note at the bus stop that read, Dad, Mama came back. Give the boys a hug. Handwriting analysis confirmed Annette wrote the note. Most believe that Annette's mother returned to take her daughter into hiding with her. If that's the case, the two have gone undetected for 25 years. Others disagree, theorizing that Stephen might have been involved with the disappearances since both girls vanished in front of his work. Despite a tip that Annette's body was buried in Sumter County, neither Annette nor Karina have been seen again, and the mystery of the missing mother and daughter remains unsolved. In 1991, a Boy Scout troop braved the July heat hiking in the San Bernardino National Forest to the summit of Mount San Gorgonio, but close to the top, 12-year-old Jared Negrete was winded and opted to stay behind until the boys returned on their down trip. However, when the troop came back, Jared had vanished. Following his shoe prints, rescue teams found candy wrappers, his backpack, and his camera. Most of the pictures on the film were of the landscape, but the last photo alarmed searchers. Jared had taken a picture of himself in the dark after he disappeared 
Though only his eyes and nose are visible, some believe he looks frightened in the photo. Theories about Jared's disappearance range from abduction to falling off of one of the mountain's steep cliffs to his death. No remains and no clues have ever surfaced, baffling authorities who usually find some trace of the missing. Jared's parents continued looking for him, retracing his steps, but it brings little consolation for not knowing what fate their young son suffered. On the morning of February 14, 2000, the Degrees planned to celebrate their 12th wedding anniversary. However, after discovering their nine-year-old daughter Aisha was missing from her bed, there would be no festivities. The night before, Aisha had gone to bed at 8 p.m., and when her father checked on her and her brother at 2.30 a.m., both were sound asleep. But Aisha had secretly pre-packed her school bag with clothes, her basketball jersey, and family photos. It is believed she snuck out of the house, locking the door behind her. Aisha was shy, but overall her home life was a happy one, so it is unknown why she would run away. Several witnesses reported seeing Aisha walking alone in the rain along North Carolina Highway 18 that morning at 4 a.m. Three days later, her hair bow, marker, and pencil were found in a tool shed one mile from her home in Shelby, North Carolina, but the search was called off due to lack of leads. A year and a half later, Aisha's book bag was found 26 miles away from her home, double wrapped with trash bags, items still inside. The FBI ran forensic tests on the items, but the results have not been released to the public. In a recent development in May 2016, police believe Aisha possibly got into a dark green car along Route 18, either a 1970s Lincoln Mark IV or a Ford Thunderbird. Aisha's parents were devastated by her disappearance and erected a billboard where she was last seen in hopes that someone will come forward with information. While some speculate that Aisha was lured out of the house by a family friend, others think she was abducted while running away. Authorities are offering a combined total of $25,000 for information leading to Aisha's whereabouts. Though 18-year-old Michael Negrete had no relation to the previously mentioned Jared Negrete, the two do have something in common. They both vanished, seemingly without a trace. In December of 1999, Michael was a student at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. In addition to having a boisterous, distinct laugh and being a talented jazz musician, he had his quirks, one of which was that he disliked bare feet. On the 10th of December, he stayed up until 4 a.m. playing video games in his dorm room in Dykstra Hall. But when Michael's roommate awoke at 9 a.m. that morning, Michael's keys, wallet, and shoes were present, but Michael was gone. Search dogs trailed his scent to a bus stop two miles from campus, but the trail ended there. The only other clue was an unidentified man seen at Dykstra Hall around 4.35 a.m. that morning. The man has never been identified or questioned. However, Michael's brother, Steve, believes his brother's disappearance was possibly drug-related, but it's unknown how he knows this. Some believe Michael walked to the bus stop without shoes, but with his aversion to bare feet and the distance between campus and his trails end, others are skeptical. Over 17 years later, and Michael's disappearance has gone cold, but the case is still open, and police suspect that the UCLA student was met with violence. We can only hope for the best, but it's likely no one will hear Michael's boisterous laugh again, except in memories. At 4 a.m. on October 4th, 2011, Jeremy Irwin returns to his home in Kansas City, Missouri to find the front door unlocked and the lights on. To his horror, his 10-month-old daughter's window is wide open and her crib is empty. Little Lisa Irwin is missing, as are three cell phones and a credit card. The hunt for the infant took the media by storm and suspicion fell on Lisa's mother, Deborah Bradley. The night of Lisa's disappearance, Deborah admitted she was drunk, but recalled putting Lisa in her crib with a blanket and pacifier that night. Cadaver dogs got a single hit next to Deborah's bed, but no additional evidence was found. 
Police at one point even falsely told Deborah she'd failed a lie detector test when in fact she had passed in order to get her to confess. But Deborah has remained steadfast that she had nothing to do with her daughter's disappearance and she believes Lisa was abducted by a stranger. There may be some truth to this theory, as several witnesses saw a man walking not far from the Irwin's house, carrying a barely clothed baby, the night Lisa went missing. Eight months after her disappearance, Deborah and Jeremy's stolen credit card was used on a website that manufactures false birth certificates. The case is still open with investigators fervently searching for Lisa under the belief she may still be alive. There is a $100,000 reward for information leading to her recovery in the hopes that Lisa Irwin will someday be returned safe and alive. On the afternoon of November 5th, 1979, 15-year-old Martin Allen boarded a train home at London's King's Cross Station. He waved goodbye to friends, thinking he would see them the next day at school. But Martin would never return. The media plastered his face all across the country while police embarked on a nationwide search, but there was no trace of Martin. Then a possible break. A witness saw a boy resembling Martin standing with a blonde-haired man at a Gloucester station the same day of his disappearance. The man had a hand on the boy's shoulder and warned him not to run away. Unfortunately, he was never identified, and almost 20 years passed before a bizarre development in the case reawakened interest. An alleged pedophile who resembled the suspect had a shrine of Martin in his house, everything from pictures to newspaper articles to a headstone. However, no concrete connection could be made, so there was no arrest. Later, an anonymous witness told authorities he'd been a victim of a pedophile ring for powerful, high-profile individuals, everyone from politicians to business moguls. The witness said they saw the murder of three young boys and thought one of them could be Martin. However, nothing has come from this lead. Martin was known to his family as a clever child who had a knack for math and art. Unfortunately, both his parents passed away before finding justice for their son but his remaining brother, Kevin Allen, continues to seek answers. At 14 years old, Lorene Ron dreamed of being an actress, and she had the passion for singing and dancing to make it happen. She was on the track to success, earning good grades at her high school in Manchester, New Hampshire, but dreams of a future turned dark after April 26, 1980. That day, Lorene took advantage of having the apartment to herself and invited two friends over for a little talking and a little drinking. When Judith got home, the light bulbs in the apartment hallway were unscrewed, leaving the pathway dark. Inside, Judith saw Lorene asleep in her bed. The next morning, she discovered it wasn't her daughter in the bed, but her daughter's friend. Lorene was nowhere to be found, but the back door was open. Police thought she'd run away, but Judith was adamant that her daughter had no reason to flee. Six months later, Judith was billed for three calls she hadn't made, all out of California. Two of the calls came from motels that were the alleged operation hub of a child pornographer called Dr. Z. The final call was to a teen sexual assistance phone line, operated by a physician whose wife admitted to housing runaways. However, there was no connection from the calls to Laureen's disappearance. Then, in 1986, a childhood friend got a call from someone saying they were Lori or possibly Laureen, but the caller was never found. Then, sightings of Laureen were reported everywhere, from Boston, Massachusetts, all the way to Anchorage, Alaska. The only possible connection was the disappearance of 26-year-old Denise Denault, who went missing weeks after Laureen, lived on the same block, and resembled the missing teen. Strangely, Judith received multiple calls from an unknown caller always at 3.45 a.m. in the years following. Whenever she picked up the phone, there was never any answer. The calls ceased after Judith changed phone numbers, but the mother believes her daughter is still alive. Tom Young and Keith Reinhardt never met each other, but they had a lot in common. Both lived in the small town of Silver Plume, Colorado.
Tom Young owned a bookstore in 1987, and a year later Keith opened an antique shop in that exact same building, and both men disappeared, but the coincidences don't stop there. On September 7, 1987, Tom Young closed up his bookshop for the day and hiked into the mountains with his dog. Neighbors expected him to return, as he'd recently talked about going on vacation in Europe, but he never did. Not long after, 49-year-old Keith Reinhard temporarily moved to Silver Plume while on a leave of absence from his writing job in Chicago. He hoped to begin writing a novel and was intrigued by Tom's disappearance and began penning a book based on the case. As his fascination grew, Keith opened an antique shop in Tom's old bookstore. Then, on July 31, 1988, the bodies of Tom Young and his dog were found in the mountains. Both had perished from a gunshot to the head. Tom bought a revolver four days before he'd gone missing, and the gun was found nearby, so his death was ruled a suicide. A week later, Keith closed up his antique shop at 4.30 p.m. and set out for a hike to the summit of Pendleton Mountain. However, the peak was a six-hour hike away, and Keith left without any proper hiking gear. He never returned, and helicopter and ground searches turned up nothing. Some speculate Keith staged his disappearance, but his wife Carolyn says he wouldn't have left his entire family behind. Others believe both Tom and Keith met similar foul play, while some felt Keith tumbled over a cliff in the dark, succumbing to the terrain. Friends and family knew Keith had desires to eventually visit West Virginia and are seeking answers in this case. They don't believe Keith would have walked away from his life, but if alive today, he would be 78 years old. Joan Risch lived in Lincoln, Massachusetts with her husband, Martin, and their two children. She had the quintessential life of a suburban housewife after leaving her thriving career in the publishing industry to become a stay-at-home mom. The 31-year-old had a seemingly perfect marriage and doted on her son and daughter, but the Risch's lives were about to change for the worst. The morning of October 24th, 1961 began like any other. Martin left for a business trip. Joan had a cavity filled at the dentist and made another appointment for Halloween. Afterwards, she picked up a gift for her husband and returned home. While two-year-old David took a nap and four-year-old Lillian played outside with the neighbor's boy, Douglas Barker, Joan did chores. Then, around 2 p.m., Joan unexpectedly dropped Lillian and Douglas off at his house, saying she would be back. Douglas's mother, Barbara Barker, later saw Joan running towards her garage, carrying something red in her arms, but saw nothing further. Lillian returned home hours later and found what she described as red paint on the walls, but no trace of her mother. The red paint was blood trailing throughout the house towards the garage where it stopped. The kitchen phone receiver was in the trash. The phone directory was open to the emergency numbers and a bloody handprint stained the wall. Yet, young David was still asleep in his crib. Joan's car was parked in the driveway, but she was gone. Later, witnesses reported seeing a disoriented woman walking along Route 128. Despite the blood running down her legs, no one stopped to help her. Some believe this was the last true sighting of Joan Risch. Curiously, investigators found that Joan was fond of murder mysteries and thrillers and had checked out 25 such books the summer before her disappearance. Though her husband claimed Joan read these for pleasure, some believe she was learning how to stage her own disappearance, theorizing that she'd become unhappy with her role as a housewife. But theories about Joan's fate range from foul play to amnesia to a botched abortion. No suspects have ever been named, and she had no history of mental illness. It has been over 50 years since Joan's disappearance, and if she truly is alive, she would be 86 years old. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of anyone featured in this episode, please see the description below for the contact information of the authorities handling each case. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out another video by pressing over here, and of course press above to subscribe to my channel now, because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.